<clears throat> Hello everyone, in human form here. If you want to support my Patreon, I'll put a link for that in the description below. But in the meantime, enjoy this video on surveillance capitalism. Do you ever feel like someone's watching you and everything you do? Well, they are. You only need to head to the ad personalization page to see a list of everything tech giants know about you and how you think. From basic demographic information to your interests and preferences. The term surveillance capitalism was first introduced by Harvard professor Shoshana Zuboff back in 2014, who went on to write the book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. This new age dawned on society as the world economy moved away from material production towards digital services with the birth of large tech corporations like Facebook. It isn't exactly one of the major technology corporations that are guilty, many of them collect this behavioral data. But many consumers already know they're being surveilled. It's not exactly a little known secret that companies track their customers, collect their data, and sell it. Yet you might not realize the full scale implications of this problem. Surveillance capitalism describes a world where you're not buying the product, you are the product. This counterintuitive and uncomfortable idea is one that most people prefer to ignore. Instead of customers paying to use Facebook or Instagram, they can access these services for free. But in return for this honor, tech giants get to keep their data. Over time, the surveillance of consumers will continue to increase to meet growing demand for data until it becomes the most prominent segment of our economic activity. This behavioral data is declared as proprietary behavioral surplus and fed into an advanced manufacturing process known as machine intelligence. As the number of devices used by the average person increases, the amount of data available is becoming practically unlimited. Your smartwatch and phone know how many steps you walk per day, your average heart rate per minute, and exactly where you've traveled. Some might argue that this is a fair exchange if people have nothing to hide and want to access their favorite apps for free, but they might not be seeing the bigger picture. We believe that the internet offered unprecedented access to proprietary knowledge. But in the harsh glare of surveillance capitalism, we have come to learn that propri proprietary knowledge now has unprecedented access to us. Collected data about your mental health crisis or recent divorce are a few examples of the types of information that could be sold to a company, and many see this as targeting vulnerable people. But this behavioral data could impact even larger scale issues, such as scandals about data being used to influence voters to favor specific candidates, which was a topic of controversy in recent years, where in the 2010s, British consulting firm Cambridge Analytica harvested personal data belonging to millions of Facebook users without their consent. The data was collected by an app developed by data scientist Alexander Kogan called This Is Your Digital Life which asked users a series of questions that were used to build a psychological profile on the user. It harvested the data of up to 87 million Facebook profiles, which were then used to target individuals for political advertising. A whistleblower named Christopher Wiley exposed the consulting firm's unauthorized possession of private data, which caused a public outcry. In response, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg testified in front of Congress. You said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is that still your objective? Senator, yes. There will always be a version of Facebook that is free. It is our mission to try to help connect everyone around the world and to bring the world closer together. In order to do that, we believe that we need to offer a service that everyone can afford, and we're committed to doing that. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. Uh, yes or no, does Facebook use audio obtained from mobile devices to enrich personal information about its users? No. Okay. The, uh, well, Senator, let, let, me be, let me be clear on this. I mean, so you're, you're talking about this 
um, conspiracy theory that gets passed around that we listen to what's going on on your microphone and use that for ads. Right. We don't do that. To be clear, we do allow people to take videos on their on their devices and um, and share those. And of course, videos also have audio. So um, so we do while you're taking a video. Um, record that and use that to make the service better by making sure that your videos have audio. But I, I mean, that I think is, is pretty clear, but I just wanted to make sure I was exhaustive there. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, hopefully that will dispel a lot of what I've been hearing. So thank you for saying that. In your testimony, you say that you have fifteen to 20,000 people working on security and content review. Do you know the political orientation of those fifteen to 20,000 people engaged in content review? Uh, no, Senator. We do not generally ask people about their political orientation when they're joining the company. So as CEO, have you ever made hiring or firing decisions based on political positions or what candidates they supported? No. The consequences of surveillance capitalism go beyond invading our privacy. It has the power of affecting our self-determination. The behavioral data collected about an individual, combined with the power of machine learning, can now understand and predict behavior better than we can ourselves. And with this knowledge, it can effectively shape and modify our behaviors. In the 1970s, when the author of Surveillance Capitalism, Shoshana Zuboff, was a student at Harvard's psychology department, she met behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner. Skinner was incredibly influential in the field of psychology and had pioneered a powerful concept that studied how environmental factors influence human behavior, called radical behaviorism. Dr. Skinner's supporters claim he is the herald of a new constructive age. It has been called the era of conscious control. But as critics ask, who is to control the controllers? When you have to free the individual from despots, tyrants, people who, uh, who control through punitive methods, the best way to, is to build up the individual, to convince him that he can be free, that the power derives from him, which is being used against him, and so on. I'm all for that. I'm all for building the individual up. But what has happened is that the control has therefore been branded as wrong because it is something we want to escape from. We don't recognize the fact that we are also controlled when we do what we want to do, when we feel free. And then you're stuck because that doesn't give you any preparation whatsoever for dealing with the kinds of control that people will exert by making you want to do what you want to do. And when you do it, you please them. That's what they, what they're, what they have in, what they're working for. And um, you, you are therefore vulnerable. And the literature of freedom has never properly taken into account the dangers inherent in the kind of control that works through volition rather than through, through punishment. Skinner believed that human behavior could be conditioned much like any animal could be trained, and that radical behaviorism and behavioral psychology could be used to build a technological utopia where citizens were trained from birth to be altruistic and community-oriented. Now, I think that the, the, a person who begins to understand behavior in a more effective way will function as some kind of specialist who will give advice but will not himself actually put it into effect. All I foresee is that teachers will teach more effectively, uh, people who arrange incentive conditions will arrange more effective incentive conditions. If there's any com controlling power, it will remain where it is now, but I should like to suppose that a culture will evolve in which it is impossible for concentrations of power uh, to, to make dictators possible. I would suppose that it, the future does not lie in any one man benevolent or otherwise, but in a culture which is the ultimate determiner of what kind of men emerge in power to make use of available scientific yes. knowledge. Zuboff states that in the age of surveillance capitalism, we have found ourselves in a dystopian version of Skinner's vision, as the tech companies with the use of algorithms can utilize behaviorism for profit and limit our options and the knowledge we access to a carefully structured echo chamber. Where do we go from here? Even the most optimistic individuals struggle to envision a future where surveillance capitalism doesn't exist. People have grown accustomed to the services and luxuries this reality provides, and tech companies, like any business, need to profit. So turning back from the current model seems doubtful. 
Some solutions suggested have been for the government to crack down on tech giants more, for us to create a transparent market where individuals sell their information willfully, and for individuals to control their use of technology more. But for now, this is the reality of the internet. Make sure to leave your opinion on surveillance capitalism in the comments below.